Now here's Ken Sella to introduce our first speaker, Ken Dykwald. Hello, and thank you for having me today. At Edward Jones, the relationships we build with our clients are one of the cornerstones of our unique approach to investing. Developing these relationships requires us to deeply understand those we serve and the challenges they face as they age. Alzheimer's disease is a public health crisis and a leading cause of death in the United States. Today, more than 6 million Americans are living with the disease, including an estimated 300,000 Edward Jones clients. Alzheimer's disease destroys not just health and wealth, but the relationships and memories of the families that we serve. It's an expensive disease that can cost people their retirement, money saved for their grandchildren's college or their children's inheritance. And this is the reason we've joined the fight to end Alzheimer's through our alliance with Alzheimer's Association and why we're sponsoring this important session today with Us Against Alzheimer's. It's also why we've partnered with AgeWave to gain meaningful insights in today's investors through research that helps us understand how, on a broad scale, people are viewing retirement today and what forces are reshaping how people prepare for this important life stage. Through our research, we've uncovered a new and holistic framework that includes four central pillars for living well in retirement, health, family, purpose, and finances. Each of them stands on their own, but they also intersect with each other a lot, and each of the four plays a role in fulfilling a wonderful retirement. With me today to share more about both opportunities and the challenges of emerging longevity landscape is Ken Dykwald, the founder and CEO of AgeWave. Ken is one of North America's foremost visionaries and original thinkers regarding the lifestyle, healthcare, economic, and workforce implications of the age wave. He is a psychologist, gerontologist, and an author of 19 books. Please welcome Dr. Ken Dykwalt. Thank you, Ken, and, uh, and a big thank you to not only you, but all the folks at Edward Jones who are making such a massive commitment to both helping families who are grappling with a loved one with Alzheimer's and also doing everything you can do as a company to support organizations to wipe this disease out. So I've got a lot to cover in the few minutes we've got to kick off this day, and I'm honored to be a part of Us Against Alzheimer's. I've been for a long while and friends and partners with George Radenberg, but I'm going to ask you a, a favor. I'm going to ask you to take all the things you currently think about this disease and don't think for a minute about all the spectacular bioscientists and physicians and experts you're going to be hearing about. Uh, and, but allow me to tell you a slightly <clears throat> different story about what's happening relative to this disease at this moment in history. And I'm going to see if I can turn over some angles that maybe you haven't thought about before. So first, uh, we've been searching for the fountain of health as long as humans have been getting older. And uh, what I'm struck by is the fact that folks think this is sort of a new adventure. Go back thousands of years to the basis of Taoism. And the intent was to not just achieve some sort of enlightenment, but to try to ward off uh, aging itself. Uh, and then along came the alchemists centuries ago who were trying to rid the body of its impurities. And then, of course... Um, as emperors and kings and queens found their bodies aching and ailing and getting old, they sent off explorers to try to find fountains of youth. Truth of it is that most of that didn't lead to anything other than a mix in geopolitics. But it was the beginning of the 20th century with the arrival of public health departments, where for the first time we began to make a dent in the diseases that used to take people's lives and cause us to not live very long. And then, a few decades later, the extraordinary arrival of antibiotics and the availability of penicillin began to save lives and extend longevity. Now, let me uh, build on that. Uh, some of you may not know what this is a picture of. Uh, it's a picture of a ward filled with iron lungs with people in those compartments with poliomyelitis. And back in the 1940s, when polio was rampant, folks thought, boy, we're going to need more and more iron lungs in the future. And wouldn't it be great if we can make them lighter and more mobile? But then along came Jonas Salk and Dr. Sabin, 
And they decided, no, we got to end this disease. And so here's George Vredenberg as a little boy getting his polio vaccine. This was 1953, of course. Uh, and all of a sudden, a disease was largely put down. Now, uh, breakthroughs in science didn't always go in a straight line. This was the 1950s and even the 1960s when the advertising campaigns for cigarettes included doctors saying that more doctors smoke camels. So we have to be careful. Not every bit of progress in medicine or science is good. Some of it is kind of nutty, and some of it we only learn years later was a mistake. But the progress continued with regard to healthy aging and healthy longevity. Before you knew it, in the 1980s and 90s, we began to introduce the idea of self-care in a serious way. We began to study the effects of exercise and sleep and proper nutrition. And then, of course, we had the breakthroughs that led to our ability to crack the genetic code. And an extraordinary pharmacopoeia simultaneously was emerging. So this searching for the fountain of, of health has really been gaining steam in the last few decades. I would say that one of the effects of this horrible pandemic we've lived through is that it accelerated our thinking about acceleration itself. How fast can we get breakthroughs? How fast can science be pushed? How fast can scientists work to get their progress not incremental but possibly exponential? Now, this is a chart of the average life expectancy at birth over the past 1,000 years to the year 2020, right before the pandemic actually began shortening lives by a couple of years. But it was moved up to about 78 and a half. And what I'm continually struck by, having been studying these issues now for 48 years, is that throughout most of history, people didn't age, they died. So back in the 18th century, we weren't worried about age-related diseases because there were so few older people. Couples didn't say, gee, honey, what would you like to do in retirement? Because you weren't going to live that long. But because of the breakthroughs that I just dashed through, one of the effects of that is that more and more and more people are going to live longer and longer and longer. Now take a look with me at this chart of life expectancy over the past 100,000 years. And medical anthropologists now tell us something quite extraordinary, which is that throughout 99% of human history, the average life expectancy at birth was under 18. Now, there have always been some 60 and 80 and 90 year olds, but very few. So we really didn't need to concern ourselves with the hopes, the desires, the attitudes of older people. And we also really didn't concern ourselves with the diseases that prey on the old. Keep that in mind. Right now, two thirds of all the people who have ever lived past 65 in the entire history of the world are alive today. And this longevity revolution is not over. It's just beginning. And occasionally people say to me, oh, I think I've seen something about the future of aging. You know, maybe it's new tech. Maybe it's all sorts of wild things that guys like Elon Musk are dreaming up or Jeff Bezos. But let me tell you that I think one of the mistakes we make is that when we envision the future, we envision kind of a Jetsons future. Young, cool, attractive people in tech advancing tech. Uh, this may or may not be a picture of the future, but I actually do have a picture of the future, and if you're ready, I'm going to show it to you. So fasten your seatbelts. Here it comes. So I saw this picture a few years ago, and when it was taken, this little guy, Bradley, was three. Sitting next to Bradley is his mom, Christina. She's 27. Standing up behind them is Kathy, the grandmother, who's 49, Next to the grandmother is the great-grandfather, Bob, who's 73. Across from him is Kitty, the great-great-grandmother, who's 95. And over on the side is Sarah Knaus, the great-great-great-grandmother at 118. A six-generation family. This is the future. And so, for example, when I hear people talk about the balance between young and old, you know, that's very mid-20th century. We have to begin thinking of six generations alive at once, each wanting their piece of the pie, each wanting their share of health resources, medical science, education, public good, 
and each playing a role in the modern society. Let me add another piece to this puzzle. The uh, kind of wild and crazy baby boom that appeared after World War II is now becoming an age wave. If you look at the 1950s, and this is a demographic portrait of each of the age groups, and it shows you which group grew or shrank by how much during the 1950s. So this baby boom clearly indicated it would have been a good time to have been a pediatric medicine or baby products or suburban homes or even life insurance. But look at what's coming. Between 22 and 2020, excuse me, and 2040, the massive growth in the United States and pretty well all the developed countries of the world is not going to come from there being more children decade over decade, but more older people. And so everything pertaining to older people, what they want to eat, where they live, what their problems are with isolation, what happens to their bodies, are going to become the focus of our lives, whether you like it or not. And I'm always intrigued. People say, what are we going to do with all those old people in the future? You're going to be one of the old people in the future. So what are we going to do with us in the years to come? One of the biggest challenges has to do with the fact that while we've been attempting to increase lifespan to improve longevity, we've done a pretty miserable job of matching our health span to our lifespan. And so as we grow older, there are all sorts of problems that occur, arthritis, varicosity of the veins, aches and pains in the joints, orthopedic problems, and I could just really ruin the whole day for everyone here. Um, as we grow older, it seems that our bodies increasingly struggle. Now, is that necessary? Is that just the way of life? So, more and more of us now in the field of geroscientists science are thinking about this. And what we're learning is that there's lifespan. And by the way, the United States, if you look at this chart, is very middling. There are 33 countries in the world that live longer than we do. Uh, many live half a decade longer than we do. So we shouldn't be so proud of our longevity here in the United States. But even more troublesome is the fact that our health spans, the number of years that we will live with vitality and well-being, are only a percentage of that lifespan. And as you can see with the U.S., we spent a lot of years sick. Now, I'm going to trouble you with the next few slides. I hope to trouble you because I'm troubled by it. This is a chart that shows the different countries in the world and how much each country spends on health care per capita. So we can be very proud, I guess, that we've made spending money on health care such a high priority because we spend more than any country in the world. However, are we getting healthy people as an outcome? No, we're not. If you look at the global life expectancy at birth, we are way at the low end of success on this. But even worse, if you look at health span, country by country, United States does miserably. So just a few months ago, I had the good fortune of speaking at a conference with pension fund managers from all over the Americas. And I asked them a kind of a live poll. So these were people in their 30s and 40s and 50s, highly educated, you know, access to information, probably had access to good health care, or so they thought. But I asked them in a live poll, which later life disabling condition scares you the most? Boom. What do they say? Alzheimer's. So, yeah, I understand that we live in a world in which things like cancer and heart disease and stroke and diabetes and arthritis are terrifying and problematic. But as we age as a nation, Alzheimer's, which takes down one in three people over the age of 85, it may actually turn out to be one in two when you add in some of the other dimensions like vascular, Louis, Louis body and, and, uh, and percussive dementias. Alzheimer's could very well turn out to be the biggest challenge in the decades in front of us as a result of our ineffective health care system combined with our greater longevity. I also want to point out that although there's been a little bit of progress with regard to treatment, aducanumab from Biogen, 
Right now, the disease is 100% incurable and 100% fatal. And I want to point out that it's not just some of those other people who catch this disease. It was Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. It's Jimmy Stewart. It was Rosa Parks. Mort Zuckerman. My mom. There was a film that came out about a year or so ago about Bill Gates' brain. And this is a tiny little clip from that. Bill Gates. What's your favorite animal? Dog. What's your favorite food? Hamburger. What do you eat for breakfast? Nothing. What is your worst fear? I don't want my brain to stop working. So why is Gates so concerned about Alzheimer's? Because he's getting older and his father died with Alzheimer's. Hey, Trump's father died with Alzheimer's. He never mentions that, but it's true. My mom died with Alzheimer's. My wife's I, mom, uh, my wife's mom died with Alzheimer's. More and more as our parents or as we are growing older, we're beginning to realize that this disease of the aging brain, yes, some people who are younger are affected, but primarily it's older people. It's a disease that preys on the aging brain. If we don't wipe it out, it's gonna wipe us out. The economic impact could be complete devastation to national economies. It could be complete devastation to families and individuals. Gates people figured out that folks with Alzheimer's spend five times more on health care than those without. In fact, Alzheimer's could become the sinkhole of the 21st century. So what do we need to do? We need to create a path to healthy longevity. We need to have doctors who are trained and skilled in dealing with older adults for all the conditions they might have, but particularly brain health. How are we doing? Badly. We've got 126 medical schools. There's only 16 departments of geriatrics. Most doctors and nurses are coming out of their programs without learning the basics about how to care for older adults or the basics of how to deal with aging brains. The numbers are crazy because we've got more than 55,000 pediatricians in America and less than 5,000 geriatricians. Maybe it's because of the way we've constructed our economics, which is foolhardy. foolhardy. We pay geriatricians far less than we pay plastic, plastic surgeons. Excuse me, but like, what's wrong with us? Next, we need precision wellness and self-care. To tell people to go out and exercise or eat a healthy diet, it's far too confusing. You go to the average drugstore and all the vitamins are organized alphabetically, which is completely dysfunctional and not helpful. How about in Japan, though? They've made some progress. This is Toto. It's a bio lab in your home toilet. So it can indicate to you on a daily basis what vitamins and supplements and foods and exercise regime might be better for your biometrics. I personally am taken by Waze, the idea that you can, in real time using AI, derive a path that's efficient, cost efficient, and will get you where you want to go. Maybe we need a health Waze so that each of us can be guided to the best 100 or 110 year old version of each of us with guidance about food, supplements, exercise, and medical care. We need scientific breakthroughs. What is wrong with us? If you look at how we spend money, what are our priorities as a country? Yikes! What is wrong with us? That we don't invest in the medical research that could wipe out the diseases so that we can live long, healthy, productive, contributing lives. Now, someone said to me just a few days ago, Ken, it's great to see that you're getting on this Alzheimer's bandwagon. Let me take you back to 1995 to the White House Conference on Aging. I had a great speaking slot. It was Clinton, Gore, then me. Here's a few moments from that. We've got to fund a great deal of research. Please, I would hope that the future legacy to our children is not 12 million Alzheimer's patients. Although we need palliative and adult daycare, we need enormous amounts of money so that Alzheimer's, so that cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, arthritis, diabetes, osteoporosis will be diseases that have an end to them. This will not happen unless we fund research. You know, I've watched every single presidential debate for the past 20 years, both sides of the aisle, and this has not been talked about. 
what is wrong with the media that they don't ask questions about this disease, which will become the sinkhole of the 21st century unless we beat it. Now, there are progress territories taking place. More and more science is creeping along. Yes, we've quadrupled the amount of federal funding for Alzheimer's research, but we probably need to multiply it by 50. But there is some, are some areas that are intriguing. Uh, we're seeing about 25 drugs right now that are coming to market that claim to be able to, to slow down or even reverse aging. What about CRISPR? Are we going to see in the next decade breakthroughs that allow us to rewrite our genetic code so that we can write cancer out of the human experience? We can write diabetes out of the human experience, and maybe we can write Alzheimer's out of our lives. I saw recently that scientists discovered the genetic code that makes jellyfish immortal. Well, maybe we can learn about their genetic makeup and transform our genetic makeup so that we can live long, healthy, productive lives. As an example of another area, it may not just be pharmaceuticals or genetic manipulation. It may be focused ultrasound which is the technology whereby in MRI chambers, sound is directed to be able to eliminate the disease and leave adjacent tissue untouched, which would render chemotherapy and radiation and surgery obsolete. What's the principle? Multiple beams profoundly and precisely targeting a point of convergence, which could be one-tenth the size of a blood cell. Here's an example a gentleman with essential tremor. He's awake. There's no anesthesia. There's no incisions, no burr holes, no electrodes. Multiple treatments through focus ultrasound. Same man. I'm taken by the recent announcement of the creation of ARPA-H, like DARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency, to try to come to leapfrogging breakthroughs in health. And from what I understand, Alzheimer's will be a key focus, which would be terrific. What's the punchline? The punchline is we must match health span to lifespan so that your loved ones don't find themselves like my mom living their final years in a crib wearing a diaper. We must match health span to lifespan so that we don't drain our economy. We must match our health span to lifespan so that 100,000 years of human growth and evolution doesn't wind up in a dark story of millions and tens of millions of people losing their way, losing their minds. We must match brain span to lifespan. Some people say, oh, that's so hard, that's too hard, let's create a new game app so we can bemuse ourselves. Well, let me remind you that Abraham Lincoln called for a transcontinental railroad, got it done in seven years. The Panama Canal was championed by Theodore Roosevelt, got it done in 10 years. The Manhattan Project, wow, that's a fairly sophisticated exercise, got it done in six years. The Apollo program, championed by John F. Kennedy, in these few seconds, got it done in eight years. Watch these few seconds. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And we did it. And the Human Genome Project, Bill Clinton championed that, 10 years. What do we need? We need a scientific grand concerto, not just one bioscientist, not just one pharmaceutical company, not just one nutraceutical company, but we need a grand concerto that's orchestrated to create healthy longevity, not just for the billionaires, but for everyone. You guys are going to hear a lot of great presentations throughout the rest of this meeting. I wish you all the best in your interest, but I would say we've got to beat this disease before it beats us. Thank you.